So basically, my name is Mokito Chiku. I'm a machine learning engineer. Um, I'm like, um, what's it called? The content lead at the MLOps community, right? Um, managing content on the newsletter. If you're subscribed to the newsletter from the MLOps community, so that's that comes from usually and the blogs. So, but the goal of the MLOps community is basically like what's building on what Steven and Gibbs have already said is to try to bring uh, the first um, MLOps community in Nigeria and in Africa as well. Like, it's really um, nice to see everyone here and sharing our experiences about how what we've been trying to do around MLOps and trying to implement MLOps in practice. Like I didn't like I, I didn't know that there's a lot going on to be fair. Like I've been in my show for a long time. But like the goal of the MLOps community, like I said, is um to um bring together folks that are doing MLOps in practice and try to share that knowledge. And this, the founder of this community is started up by Demetrius. So Demetrius started this community to ensure that we get to know each other. Stop, stop guys are doing folks are doing stuff within this space and try to interact with each other. Um, so, you could join the MLOps community Slack channel by going to mlops.community. Um, that's the website. So, you can just look it up now. And um, if you're not on the Slack, you can join the Slack. You can also subscribe to the, the meetups, um, the newsletters. And yeah, so technically, we could all connect there and also share experiences with folks outside Nigeria, within Nigeria, and all that. Uh, so if you're any like say somebody as you are in Lisbon or you're in Munich or somewhere abroad um, you can also join the MLOps community there in person meetups and attend the meetups there there are there are always meetups are happening all around the world in different cities in different countries so um, thank you very much and nice for everyone coming thank you very much um, internship I think with um, this latest internship with Amway and then with um, ELX on Udacity. So it's just it like a progressive phase for me, just trying to learn and get better at the space and find ways to um, combine you know, machine learning and then providing AI, AI health solutions. Especially after I saw Steven Odaibo on LinkedIn and I read his profile, I was like, wow, that means this is definitely possible. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, so thank you for that. Uh, I think you have to speak, right? Please just. School. Uh, I studied economics at the University of Portacourt. And, and after school, I interned with Hotels or NG here as a digital marketer. So my data science journey started from there. Like when I go to do some analysis with websites and stuff, and I was getting to know more about the, the field of study. But then, once since one. Something made me go back to school then. And I was privileged to meet Steven. I don't know if he remembers. It was one that gave me the resources I used to start that journey. And I would say that I was a self-taught. I never did any formal program on data science whatsoever. So I self-taught for over two years. And I worked at any bank. I actually applied for a technical role at any bank. Unfortunately, they didn't give me that role that I applied for. But then I still kept on learning and with time, I got a job in Stamic IBTC now as a data scientist. Praise God. Praise God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so thank you for that. So we call it. I personally know this journey. That's why I was delaying it. Yeah, so thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ayola. So I'm a data engineer. My journey started when I was in school as well. I started, um, I had friends that built um, Android application in schools and um, do data analysis. So at first I started coding in with R. I took Coursera courses. So I got to meet uh, people online on Twitter, LinkedIn. Then I got courses recommended to me. I started with that nano degree in data engineering. In data engineering, then shortly after I started volunteering as a data engineer in in a um, financial institution in New York. So during my volunteering experience, I met the founder of Willow Finch, which like kind of like impressed with what I do as a data engineer. I helped build um, a cloud um, infrastructure. I got um, 
a job with a consulting um, firm in Nigeria that builds solutions for different companies in Nigeria, financial institution, companies in another country as well. So I help automate um, reporting process for banks, insurance companies, works on I worked on data quality projects, I work on um, well, several projects, build um, data infrastructure, cloud migration, and all of that. So it's, it's a lot, but then that's just a summary of my journey. Yeah. Yeah. MLOPS Lagos is actually the first MLOPS community in Africa. Yeah, we are hoping to extend to other parts where different organizers are, will handle it. So currently, the organizers of Hemelops Lagos are like, don't you, can, can you just signify? Yeah, we have Steven. Steven, I was talking about Hemelops here, and me. Yeah, so my name is Gifts Ujabulu. Yeah, these are the three organizers of Hemelops Lagos. Yeah, lab. So he's also an AI engineer, like he was an AI engineer at Parallel School, and he, he used to work at Data um, Science Nigeria, Data Science Network now. And he has experience from research to technical content to like using machine learning like in production and all yeah so we also have Chinedu Chinedu is currently a data scientist that in the Sina in the Sina is a fintech platform fintech company I think yeah so yeah one of the leading fintech company in Nigeria in the Sina yeah so that's that's it and we also have Fit. Fit is uh, a data scientist at um, Sterling Bank with over three plus years, an associate data scientist with over three plus years of experience. And we also have, uh, uh, yeah, the, the uh, data scientist from Andela that will also be handling the session. Yeah, so I just want us like pay attention to this like state and all. Oh, thank you for that. Yeah, sweet. Like yeah. the problems. Like testing the feasibility and so forth to so actually deploy the models as well as you know best practices maybe advice they might give to people who are either in their company thinking about starting out ML or people who are actively data scientists but want to see how they can get the models to solve real world problems uh, and continuously deliver business value all right so I'm, I'm going to start with uh, Elisha and I just really want you to give us a, a background of uh, of uh, yeah okay yeah the a background of the the use cases that you use ML to solve, um, both at Rec Labs and maybe you th through your previous experience at Brother Scope. But I think let's focus more on Rec Labs because Rec Labs is, uh, is, is uh, solving problems for Nigerians as well, Nigerian clients as well, I believe. So maybe you can give us a rock down into that um, idea first. Let's go. All right. So if I get your question very well, yeah. more or less like the use cases. Yeah, yeah. The use cases you are actively solving with Rec Labs. Yeah. Okay, so basically, let me start by, you know... Uh, Nigerian clients. <laughs> Nigerian clients. Okay, so a couple of Nigerian clients that we are working with, they are more or less like uh, dual citizens kind of people. Right. You know, they, they operate within the Nigerian ecosystem. They also operate in the UK, US, right. and all. Right. So, um, typical use cases that we've been working around first one has been support, right. right? That's a typical use case that we've looked into. And we've done quite a number of things around um, football, basketball, baseball, right? Let me just basically, let me just stop at that. That's a typical use case that we've you right. know, really, really addressed. And, and I know this is more of a, rather than, because I think the different, the different ideologies around using ML is that, this is actually an ML startup, right? It's not as though it's a it's a financial startup and then you know they're applying ML. So actively, can you really sort of walk us through how you sort of think about applying ML to your product? Because of obviously the synthetic data side of things, I believe that's like active learning and ML technology. So how do you actively do ML in your company? Okay, so um, let me just start by saying um, ML has been more or less like part of us, right? right. So of us that. It was just a myself and my friends. We decided that we should start Rec Labs. Now, the major reason why we started Rec Labs was because we wanted to, you know, do something different. Right. Right. We've been doing quite a number of research, you know, in the 
individually and all and then we we went ahead with uh, exploring so many things so we knew the power of what ml could do could change right, right. within the nigerian ecosystem the power of what ai could do to a lot of products that can emanate from the right. african ecosystem right so we went from that to you know uh solving quite a lot of problems for businesses right, right. so to us ml has been fun right right and right. the way we've we've been applying it has just been dynamic for us right, right. so we built infrastructures to you know accommodate almost every kind of problem we solve but you know like i said we are more or less like a research more or less like an AI research company right. first before even product, product yeah. so because of the fact that we do a lot of ai research right it's able to, it's it's flexible for us to move from research into products unlike a lot of other companies whereby you are not really doing ai or you are not doing ai maybe you are just building a mobile app that does does something right right but you know in those kind of scenarios you are not really serious about modeling and the likes you are not improving models right but in our own case scenario we are dealing with heavy ai systems yeah. heavy models right and it's not something whereby you're just using logistic regression or XGBoost or the likes, right? You're looking at big AI models that, models that are like maybe one gigabyte right. in size, right? And they are doing massive things, recognize faces, recognize actions of people, right? right. Just for instance, recognizing the action that Messi is carrying out on the field. Yeah. All those things are not just small i just take image and i'm just predicting on right. one simple neural network and the like right. so we have to build pipelines right right to solve those problems to accommodate those things right but as a result of the fact that we've done quite a number of things around research it was easy for us right. so when we just injected these things into the system it was just flexible and all she you understand right. so that's that's just it right so we are we're going to get a bit more into the details of like the the systems there but if you have any question please find a way to write them down after i just sort of walk through um the the, the panel then you know we can open the floor for uh questions so let me um hi okay i i just wanted to understand a bit more about your experience with like um, um applying ml in the real world what's that been like okay so in generally or uh, in nigerian uh, ecosystem. nigerian ecosystem yes okay uh so since i joined and then i have not been working with nigerian but uh, before I joined Andela, uh, I worked with uh, Cast 45 and AutoCheck. Right. Um, so generally, um, AutoCheck is a car financing company, right? And then you go there, uh, you want to uh, get the prices of your cars, right? Right. Uh, so before I came on board, right, uh, you know, the process is always long. You know, uh, try to understand the market uh, scenario of your of you know, to understand the price they are going to give your car, right? Right. Uh, but then, since we have access to the market data, we also have access to uh, scripts on other uh, marketplaces. Right. Uh, so we are able to come up with a robo robust model, right, uh, right. to uh, predict the prices of cars, you know, basically. And yeah. uh, not only just prediction, uh, we deployed it, uh, which is right. part of the ML ops. Uh, and then um, it serves everyone. Uh, if you go to the website, you can impute your car uh, details there, and then they give you the uh, potential prices uh, right. of the range of your cars, right? Uh, so that's just one of the things we did. Um, in addition to that, we also worked on some recommendation system also. Right. Uh, if you are on auto check, you notice that you get some emails uh, from them. Uh, these are some of the um, these are some of the uh, those emails, those cars they are sending you. They are powered by email models. Right. Recommendation systems, uh, based on what you are looking at on the website, based on how you are interacting on the platform, uh, is forwarding you those emails, uh, just so that it's trying to predict your preference. Right. You know. So, uh, in tho those are some of the things we uh, yeah. we worked on while while I was uh, at Auto Check then. Uh, but then, when I moved to um, Abort Pandas uh, in Lithuania, I worked more on advertising data. And then right. uh, digital data, but um, what we do 
basically it's just you know try it because we produce data content and then we try to uh, analyze user's behavior uh, to you know what we what we actually trend what we people like right you know to do a lot of trend analysis and predictions are uh, basically even to the point of using analyzing thumbnails images right yeah. to uh, know to actually uh, predict what is going to trend what people like mm -hmm. uh, basically yeah. so um, and then uh, when I started working with uh, spend juice in US uh, we work we serve African clients also right uh, so some of our problems are also attached uh, some of our problems are a local fintechs right. uh, face also apply to us right I mean in terms of fraud pretension uh, 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 fraud present pre prevention right, basically yeah. so a lot of tools out there right they don't really serve us like that you know because right. Nigerian fraudsters are very dynamic <laughs> 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 you know yeah. they, they are very dynamic they, I mean they change their styles every time so if you use maybe cast two or some of these products right, right you won't catch all of them and most of the time right if you if fraud is happening on your fintech platform um, your service provider or your or your banking partner they are going to be raising red flags and they might draw your license or they might try to shut down your product and if you shut down your product that's the, that's the end of everything so right. you have to uh so we 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 are working on uh putting some uh you know some a lot of fraud fraud pretension uh, pre right. uh prevention uh algorithms right into right. place uh, in addition to some of other uh, um uh, tools we are using basically uh, awesome. so that's yeah Perfect. So let's let's dig a bit deeper into your experience at Cars Forty Five. So how do you really go from understanding the problem at Cars Forty Five to actually deploying the model? Just at a high level, just walk us through your workflow. Okay. Uh, let me talk about. Uh, okay. Auto check. Both of them are almost the same. But uh, okay. All right. <laughs> yeah. So um, I mean, I mean, this is a problem they face, right? Yeah. Uh, and then everybody within the company knows that this thing is taking time. Uh, it's, it's taking a lot of manpower, you know, and then at the point it is even companies even losing money. Imagine you want came, you want to buy a car, and then uh, you say we t we tell you maybe the person charge tells you like two million naira, and then at the end of the day you check the market, right? It's two point five. That's a five five hundred k loss, right? Mm. Uh, I mean it's not efficient, right? Uh, so uh, the company is losing money. Uh, we need to find a way to actually uh, optimize the process by which we we set prices for cars, right? And then not just that, right? So that we know overcharge users, we also know that undercharge users, like fair price. So the best way for it to look at is like, okay, where can we get now? In our own database, we have to rely on uh, old data first, right? Uh, right? And then these data are not even enough. You know, we want to be something very robust. Uh, so that means we have to scrape other uh, marketplaces. Scraping right. is not illegal, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so <laughs> scraping is not illegal. We have to we have to scrape other uh, car websites uh, data. Uh, we add uh, the data we were modeling is up to like is uh, more than 100 gig of data, you know, mm. that we train our model on just to be able to show that we are able to get accurate. Um, uh, accurate um, prediction for your car for cars that you want to buy. Now, yeah. the, like I said, the first thing is actually getting enough data for your model. Sorry, how, how did you store the data? Yeah. How did you store the data? The, story, we, the storage mechanism was it like on cloud or the? Yeah, of course, it's going cloud. to be on cloud. Yeah, you know. Right. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So the data we have, um, uh, we have uh, our Postgres SQL. Mm -hmm. uh, we okay. use Postgres for our DB then, uh, but you know, it's just for deploy development, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. But for analytics and other ones, we have uh, a big query yeah. that we use for analytics. But for anything deep, deep, uh, development related, uh, we use Postgres. Right. Uh, so uh, we store this data, we get mm -hmm. the data, we build, not just, we build a, uh, a pipeline to actually update this data. Yeah. Now, all the places where we scrape data, we just don't scrape it once and leave it. Prices change, dynamic. So we, there was a pipeline that is constantly updating this, uh, this uh, database, right? So after we after we solve the problem of this, because the phone of the first headache we have is how are we going to get enough data to uh, to solve our problem? And then we 
be able to write the script to scrape a lot of websites, clean it up, uh, and put it in our database. So we're able to solve that one. Uh, so uh, the next thing was, OK, uh, we have to experiment with a lot of uh, now. During the model process of getting data, cleaning, we know what we want. We know uh, what you know our end goal, right? Yeah. We know so when we are collecting data, we are collecting that in mind. You know, we are already solving the problem of uh, um, dirty data. You know, all those uh, all those problems you can have with data. So right. along those pipelines, we clean it up. We make everything. Uh, we make. We take care of all the issues we might have in our data. Don't forget, all these things come with iteration. This yeah. guy I'm just telling you is, you know, <laughs> yeah. So it comes with iterating over and over again because you can't solve all your problem at once, right? So when we, when we, so when we are okay that okay, these data sets are okay for us, all right? And then we have to train on them basically, right? Now we can't use normal pandas on this kind of data. You know, yeah. you can't use normal pandas. It's going, you are going to get memory time. Uh, mem your memory is going to time out. Yeah. <laughs> so, so uh, we have to use Py, Py Spark. You know, mm -hmm. uh, Spark handles uh, your data in a distributed way, yeah. sort of. So, when you are working with big data, trust me, your pandas is not going to work for you. You know, but well, maybe it can work. I don't know. But <laughs> well, yeah, well, from my own experience, it's not going to work. So, you are going to use a distributed system, right, to uh, handle your uh, predictions and everything. So. Uh, that was what we did, right? And then when we have our model ready, and that is to do cost-benefit analysis, basically. Now, how much are we losing based on wrong, uh, uh, wrong, you know? So now, when you are dealing with uh, machine learning production in terms of relating to business, it's not just about building model that has good accuracy, having good prediction. You have to consider its impact on your business. Now, the question is, with this model, uh, the cost is going to cause is going to be relevant to the business. Yeah. You know, so because there was a time, right? You know, we I worked on one fancy model, you know, and then when I, I did the cost benefit on our infrastructure, it, it's going to it's too much, right? It's like I just have to drop it. Like, okay, yeah. this is not going to make any sense for the business because the the mon and that's why you see a lot of people don't even don't even want to think about deep learning, you know, because of the infrastructure. It doesn't worth it, you know. Like, <laughs> it's making your business maybe ten thousand dollars, and you are spending thirty thousand, fifty dollars on infrastructure. It doesn't make any sense. So, a lot of people don't even want that. Want to go into talk about deep learning with them or something in terms of business uh, applications. So, uh, we do the cost benefit analysis, and we say, okay, consider the money we are losing uh, to what's called wrong uh, analysis of cost, right? And to uh, even the even the uh, people demand power and everything, right? and the amount of money you are going to spend on infrastructure deploying this model, yeah. and I will say that okay, the cost benefit analysis makes sense, right? And then that's when we now proceed to uh, deployment and yeah, uh, yeah. perfect. And um, just one final question on the deployment side: How did you sort of did you do any maintenance on the model? Because obviously the data, like you mentioned, is dynamic. So how did you consistently update the model to make sure that it was relevant to the business problem? Yeah, thank you. So, uh, you know, the yeah, what's called the uh, cast data, right? Okay. It's changing almost yeah. every day. You know, uh, your model has to be updated every day. So, uh, we separated our data with timestamp. Uh, our model, you know, because of also because I could have done live streaming of the data, right? right? But if I look at it, right? You know, the cost is going to be too much. Yeah. So what I did was batching. Yeah. Right. So I batch uh, the process of updating the database. Now streaming it is going to be expensive. You know, like yeah. I said, when you are working in a business environment, right? <laughs> the cost has to be at the top of your head. Everything right. you are doing. <laughs> everything you are doing. So I have to batch the process. So two times every day, uh, the database update. Right. You know. Uh, uh, and then we set a threshold for the uh, accuracy of our model. So when it goes beyond a, a particular threshold, uh, it alerts me. You know, uh, I set up a just a, a alert system, right? Yeah. Because as it's turning out prediction for every user, I cross check it. Um, I return a particular yeah. uh, accuracy. accuracy score, so yeah. when it Confidence. goes beyond a particular accuracy, I go there to check what is uh, 
what is wrong with the yeah. this thing. So in a day, if a ten thousand people uh, comes uh, to the website to to uh, to check the prices of your car, and then at the end of the year, I check the average uh, average accuracy for that day, right? And it's below my threshold. I know that the following day I have to uh, work on reworking some of the things in the model. Right. You know, so yeah. Right. So yeah, that's that's as foundational as it gets. Thank you so much for sharing that. Okay, please. So again, if you have any question, please write it down right after the session. You will be given the liberty to ask your questions. I feel, please, can you please give us your experience in like uh, the old data science space and you know how that how you sort of apply that as well at your company. Um. So I did start off as a data scientist. I was first a data analyst, okay. and um, after spending a year there, I wanted more, so I scaled up. So in terms of data sciences, the first model I was exposed to was customer segmentation. So most entry level, they have to do that first. So you have to segment customers and build reports from that. So basically, we use that to cross sell. We have a lot of products in Sterling Bank, yes. So and we always want you to have more. There's, you must always have more from us. So that was my first exposure. The second model I had to build was to predict customers that were likely to leave a particular product. So for me, after building the model, like the normal steps of building model, gathering my data, discussing with the business first and doing everything, I got curious as to, okay, I've built this model, how will I use it? Like, right. what, okay, yes, we know the accuracy is this, is doing this, is doing that, but what is the benefit to the business? How will I put it into production? So I had a conversation with my line manager, and he was like, okay, um, I'm still young in the field, but it's going to expose me to the full end-to-end so it, it made me the technical writer. <laughs> it took me to writing of a fraud management system. It was like, go and write, go and document. That I, I, I wasn't happy 100% because why should I be writing? It was like, if you document it, you will understand it. So I had to, from the beginning, from the data gathering, end to end, I was missing every one of them. Please, what did you do today? How did you do it and everything? But today I'm grateful that it made me go through that process because it allowed me to see beyond building models. It allowed me to see what a model can do in production, what the frustration can be. So for me, what I discovered there, um, after it was a fraud model, after building the fraud model and seeing how important one documentation is, how important um, your data is, and also um, how important your um, the entire MLO processes. So first of all, when it comes to the data, um, our portion was first of all an imbalanced data. We didn't have so many fraud cases to um, add to the system. So we could have like 30% was fraudulent, 70% were not fraudulent. And that um, they had gone far before they realized that what we were bringing out was rubbish. So imagine having all the senior men going to start from the beginning again. And I had to redocument again from the beginning. They had to change their data sources. They had to change the kind of data they were capturing to build that system. And then um, eventually, when they were able to like, build the model, they tried different models. And then what I talked about cost effectiveness, they had to measure it. Our best model wasn't effective, was not cost effective. It's uh, efficient, I mean. So they had to use another model to put into um, into to start and um, put production. So when we got to the point of um, production, there are a lot of issues too when it comes to production, like building the pipeline and everything, and ensuring that um, it was moving um, was automated. Because, like I said, patterns will always change. People are always finding new ways to um, dupe people. So what we predict as not fraudulent, if it turns out to be fraudulent, a customer will come to your bank and they'll tell you that someone took my money, why didn't you catch it? So we, we had to um, continuously train and retrain the model. Even when the model went into production, we didn't allow it to start eating live data. What we would do is we'll batch the data um, we'll give it to the model. If it's able to predict right, if it doesn't predict right, we'll make some parameter tune and everything. Till now, 
um, we we have not um, pushed it to start eating data so much, but we are still monitoring its performance. Where we use other fraudulent um, fraud to so that was like the journey for me to ML up, seeing what versioning can do and everything. So eventually, I got my own project to do end to end, and that was statement analyzer. And what I had to do was to um, get customer statements, analyze it. So that was like a natural language processing and everything. And um, for the um, MLOps part, I needed to understand that customer spending habits would not be the same. As in, I'm a customer now. At this point in my life, I may be into a particular thing, and then next point, I'm a different person. So knowing that categories of spending will change was something I had to put into consideration when it comes to production. So um, if you have seen my experience, I would say it's been a growth. I didn't start up being like, you know, I didn't even know what MLOps was about as of early last year, to be honest. I didn't know that something has to go, but I was curious as to what will I do with this model. So curiosity too will help you. It doesn't matter the field you come from. I heard some people come from health. It doesn't matter, to be honest. As long as you're curious, wanting to know more. You keep pushing. Like, I, I'm pretty sure that there's something more than MLOps. Maybe it's the AI now. Start looking at you know that's something about me. But yeah, first of all, look at how people are doing it. So for me, it was fraud system. How they did hand to end. I used to call them senior men. I still call them my senior men because I still have to go to them and ask them how is it going well. And I found that it was even more than just the normal data extraction and all those things. There's real coding. In MLOps, yeah, thank you. Right, so the real code in MLOps is a, is a key thing I think we should take home with that. And in terms of the, the team set up at Stamping Bank, what is it like? Is there like a separate data team, uh, fraud expertise, and then there's an IT team that, you know, that takes, that does the production? And what's that set up like? Okay, so in Stamping Bank, um, we have the data engineers. Okay. They are the ones that deal with um, getting the data in for us and, you know, some other things. We are the data analysts. Right. Those ones are the ones that help us build um, reports that monitor the model performance sometimes right. offline. We also monitor on the cloud, but we also monitor using like the Power BI dashboard and everything. And then we had the data scientists, yes, right. they're the ones that build the model. Initially, um, MLOps was separate from data, so we only had one person doing MLOps. Yes, but when he was about to leave, like three months to him leaving, <laughs> my boss was like, everybody will have to go and learn the MLOps. So most data scientists had to go and work with him to right. learn MLOps. So we have the technical team. So once um, the MLOps, we, once we are true, I'm able to bring the API. We give the tech team for them to implement in the system. Right. So yes, that's like, there, there's obviously the fraud team, those ones, the monitor. So when the um, fraud system detects as fraudulent, the ML system can't truncate the transaction. It has to alert the fraud team. The fraud team will right. be the ones to investigate and truncate. Right. Yeah. Right. So I, I think we can notice that sort of human in the loop side. It's not just like completely automated. There's also a fraud team that actually checks the stuff so that, I mean, um, uh, that, that sort of checks out the entire system. So thank you so much for sharing that thing. Please. Uh, so a bit of your background on data science and how that's being applied right now in the center. Okay, um, I initially worked with Elisha. He was my boss at Parallel School, surprisingly. Oh, nice. Yeah, so I, I joined uh, in the center. When I joined in the center, uh, they already had the infrastructure, so things are already like built. Uh, so what we do there is uh, we build infrastructure for lenders. Right. So if you want to lend, uh, you don't need to like start from scratch. So we have platforms that will help you do that. So all you need to do is have like we have a product called Originate. So when you go there, the lender goes there, imputes some parameters and all that. Uh, so people can come there to borrow money and all that. Right. Um, so our team is quite mature. We have um, a data engineering team. We have data uh, science team, data right. scientists, and we have um, ML ML ops teams. We also have engineering team on the side. So I currently work with the data in the data scientist team. Right. Uh, so we uh, build credit risk models. Uh, so basically what we do is um, we get data from lenders, from um, banks and all that. So we analyze your data, we try to uh, find spending pa uh, spend patterns, um, your behaviors, how, how do you spend your money, uh, do you gamble, um, like we just 
get your, your details right. and all that. So we, we built an, a, a system um, called Decide, which is very powerful. Uh, so it, it gives us those information. Then we use it to build, um, because in Nigeria, we don't really have like a, a credit score. So we right. build credit scores for, for those lenders. So they use that to decide if they have to give you money or not. Right. Uh, so I'll say before I joined, uh, we had some issues of scaling up was a big challenge for us. Uh, but over time, we had to overcome that. Uh, we currently do most of our things on, on cloud. We use AWS. Um, right. So uh, before before joining the team, I didn't know that data engineers are very, very important. But they're actually very important because without them, I'm not sure you even need data scientists to start with. So they put the data for you. They store it efficiently. Uh, they transform it, run those pipelines. Like without them, you can't, can't, do, you can't do much. So uh, recently we built, we, uh, we just completed our big project, um, our data warehouse, which has really made life a lot easier for everybody. Right. Um, so, and I also saw that, I've seen that, um, like the second speaker mentioned, um, uh, performance is not, is important accurate. If it's, if it's too, if it, if, if it makes the business suffer, then it's not beneficial. If it's too costly. Right. So, so what stakeholders want to hear is, uh, they, want, they want that fine balance between performance and cost effectiveness. Yeah. So even if your model is like 100% accurate, they don't really care. Right. If it's costing them so much money, they don't care because they're the ones footing the bill. And they want models that are easy to explain. They don't want complex models. So if you build deep learning models for them, they don't really care, at least in the Nigerian market, because they can't explain it. And they want to explain to those bank, banks what, what are the f uh, features that are important. If you just tell them something is doing something, they want to know how is it generating those outcomes. Like they want you to explain it to them. Right. So I've also seen that that's very, very important. Uh, then lately I've also been uh, pushing towards the MLOps um, side of things, how to um, transfer what you've done in the research environment right. into production. Even though we have like a team that is currently doing that, but like you said, I would also want to do more because I've kind of gotten tired with my Jupyter and the research yeah. uh, kind of things. I want to uh, like transition into into MLOps and start pushing things into production. I've, I've I've started doing that, but I want to do that like full time now. Right, and and in terms of that transition, what are those skills you're currently trying to pick up? Pretty much. Okay, uh, like like you also mentioned, coding is very very important. So, right. uh, it's a different ball game just writing things on Jupyter Lab because uh, you have to ensure that your your code is efficient. You know, yeah. you don't have to just write loops anyhow and all. It has to be very efficient. You have to refactor things well. You have yeah. to just follow basically those uh, software uh, yeah. principles. Yeah, principles. You have to use that dry principle. Don't repeat yourself multiple times. Yeah. Uh, modularize your code, use classes, those yeah. things. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, I'm also reading things on um, design systems. So, like, I'm trying to understand things. And I've, I've seen that it's not just coding. You have to, like, understand things before you even start coding. Right. You have to talk to the business and talk to stakeholders. Like try to understand the business before even uh, coming up with solutions. Right, that's been very helpful. Yes. Yeah, that's that's awesome. Thank you so much for for sharing that. So I'm um, just gonna open the floor for questions before we go finally into best practices. So if you have any question, um, okay, I'm just gonna start from from the front and then. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is my name is Abdul Latif, and um, my question is for Elisha. Um, because my data journey started with spot analytics, so I'm trying to know more about how you run your whole spot vision and direct vision and direct direct spot. My question is that do first I think two questions. Uh, do each spot have their own pipeline or you have like a system for all the, that goes through all the sport? Like you have a pipeline for football, for basketball, for baseball, or you just have a general generic system that you use for all sports. And then my second question is how how do you I really want to know how you apply because when I started it was basically for dashboarding, knowing the expected goal for players, expected assist and all that is it is it do you use it for scouting like what what exactly do you export 
Yes, like basically that's what I see. Sport analytics for for dashboarding, for scouting, and for the highest I've seen them do is player segmentation, where you cluster players like that have the same stats. And basically for scouting, like, is there more to it to than than? All right, thanks. All right, so thank you very much for that question. Right, so let me start by saying that um, at Red Clubs, we one of the major things that we said we wanted to solve is we wanted to make AI something very, very easy for people to do, right? So we went to go build Rect Vision, right? So Rect Vision is more or less like a platform that is a low-code, no-code platform. So it's low code and it's also no code. It is no code in the sense that you just have to do is to plug in the data and then you just it takes care of the rest. The modeling, the deployment, and then you have your endpoints that you can plug into your mobile app. That's what RegVision does. So you don't have to bother about the coding process and all. So we've set up the pipeline. Do you understand? It deploys to cloud for you and all those things. Right, then the low code part is more or less like for developers want to, to try out or build or stack different AI systems together, right, to achieve something much more robust. For instance, so now let me now streamline Red Vision down to Red Spot. So, in order to make, um, in order to make Red Vision much more uh, simpler for people to understand, right. And for me to be able to appreciate it more, we decided to look for a body called Spots, right? So we built Rect Spots in Rect Do you understand? Now, what exactly are we trying to achieve with Rect Spots? Uh, using it in scouting, betting, and it comes to Spots. So we have quite a number of sports games that we've been working around. We are working on baseball. We are work. We have a client in the UK that we kind of working with with respect analytics, and then we are using some sort of AI algorithms and the likes. And the same thing goes for the basketball, right, and the football. Now, if you look at those three scenarios, for instance, we also have tennis. That makes it four. If you look at those three scenarios, they are all different. In football, you have like, you know, 11 teams, right? And then in basketball, you, are, you have, you get, then tennis is just two, right? One of the things that's, okay, for instance, now, when, when I started, when we started with uh, this sports stuff, we st I started by building more or less like an environment whereby the AI can play, you know, the tennis by itself. Then from there, we migrated into some much more complex stuff. So what am I trying to say is that the pipelines are different, but there are some common stops when it comes to the pipelines, right? So those common things are what we, you know, that is kind of generic. And then when it comes to the analytical stops, recognizing the action, recognizing dribbles, recognizing passes, long passes, and all those things, right? It's different. In... Um, in basketball, the actions we are capturing is different from football, right? So the modeling is completely different. The analytics is completely different. So what we do, so basically what Sport does for a lot of players is to help them become better players by seeing their statistics. So what they do is they download the app, they upload their videos, and once they up upload their video, the AI takes the video, analyzes the video, generates all their stats, tells them where they you know, did well, where they didn't do well. And then the coach can also see those stats and make some recommendation. Instead of the coach watching the old game, oh, you did nonsense here, you did not do this, you're supposed to pass here, this is the opportunity here, you lost the opportunity. And the AI can also give recommendation of, oh, whenever you are in a position, you have a 5% chance of doing this. Or you have you have seventy percent chance of doing this instead of doing this. You know, a lot of recommendation stuff just to make you know the game much more exciting. So that's that's it. Awesome, awesome. Thanks for sharing. Um okay. Okay. The, the, the other mic, please. Where is the other mic? So I will just
Chizaba. Ba. Good afternoon, everyone. So my question is to the panel. Um, most of you work with different structures of data. So um, I want to know if at any point in time you've ever had to use a multimodal data fusion technique to incorporate different structures. That is like use, say, image and tabular data together for any use case and how you went about it. Presently, at in the center, we don't make use of um, uh, image data at the moment. So uh, we don't we don't use image data, but we use different um, sorts of data like structured and unstructured. But at the moment, we don't use um, image data, so we've not really had to use that. Okay, so um, images there are also numbers, right? And um, your uh, your Algorithms, right? Most general algorithms, maybe except for maybe cat boost, right? Uh, they understand only numbers. Now, what you do is uh, analyze uh, the different processing you are going to do for images, right? I work with image uh, data. Uh, when you look at trying to de uh, detect car defects in car in the uh, physical structure of cars, now what you need to do is you are going to analyze that um, uh, that image separately right from your uh, other data now just like when you what you do for um, what you do for categorical variables and uh, and numerical variables you analyze them separately are you you know you there is different processing for uh, data processing right for di different manipulation for categorical different manipulation for numerical right just the same way right your your images are also numbers right they are uh, ways you can transform those images into numbers for your algorithm to access. So that's the way you work with them. Don't don't look at it as all of them are the same thing. You know, just where you separate numerical, categorical. You know, just change your image to to that one too. So just to um, add to what you said, you said, is there any scenario whereby you you can put the two of them together? Y yeah. So in Red Sports, we have that scenario. Now in Red Sports, we are working with video data, right? Now we have a pipeline while the AI is is watching the because basically the AI actually watches the game. We built the AI to watch the game, and when it's watching it, it's seen it as an image, and it's able to you know do more or less like a spatiotemporal processing. So it looks at the time space at which an action happens captures those information now as he's doing those things he's storing those data in form of um, in a structured format more or less like uh, tabular form in its memory right there's another part of the AI that takes those tabular data and is running predictions and is making inferences so there's this part of active watching and there's this part of active prediction, right? So it's more or less like, it's more or less like multiple systems happening at the same time. So those things are possible, but one major thing is that the pipelines are different. There's a pipeline for, because what you're seeing is uh, image data and they are unstructured forms, right? Tabular data are structured. So the way you process a tabular data is different from the way you process and image data. You know, when you're looking at images, images are, I images are actually matrices, matrices. You know, when you say three by three, all those mathematics that you're doing, but actually in the real sense, when you're solving those kind of problems, it's not three by three. You're looking at the uh, 5,000 by, do you understand? And the more the size of the image, the much more clearer, the much more beautiful, and that's why you're able to zoom, and you're like, wow, I find gone. You get, here you get. So, the processing, the pipelines are different, right? But it's possible for you to have those two things happening at the same time. It depends on the kind of system you are building. So sorry, I've been talking about AI, 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 AI. AI. That's what we are kind of used to in Red Labs. Thank you. We also do data science too. You know. <laughs> awesome. Thanks. Um, any okay. The second mic, please. Mike. 
Okay. Um, my question is, like, like you said, right? Cost is very important for any business. And at Auto Check, he works with hundred gig of data on the cloud. So my question is basically, um, on the cloud, right? How did you optimize your cloud storage or your data warehouse storage in order to reduce cost? Because I mean, hundred gig is going to take a lot of you're going to take a lot of money, basically. So, like, how did you optimize your cloud storage to reduce costs? Thank you. Uh, actually, you are storing your... You are using Postgres, right? Postgres is very cheap. <laughs> yeah, Postgres is very cheap. Like, um, on, like, BigQuery. That's why you don't use BigQuery for uh, development. You know, because deep, deep BigQuery uh, charges you on every call you make. You know, whereas if you just if you dump your data in Postgres, it's very cheap. Uh, I think AWS is zero point five cents or something per gig or something. You know, it's very cheap. So uh, that's why. But then another thing you can do to optimize is by indexing your data set, right? Yeah. So uh, that way, it um, you you uh, when you are querying your data set, right? Uh, it reduces the cost. But then storage is very cheap like when it comes to if you are using this kind of database postgres is very cheap that's why even if you put in one terabyte it, it, the cost is very small so you don't have to worry about that but then if you if you really want to go to deep into uh up to, if you want to go further in re reducing the amount of money you spend just in index your data set sorry um my question is on the problem of machine learning alignment. Like, I want to ask if there is any formal or like qualitative way of measuring if a model, like the intentions of a model or the objective it is solving, is the same as the objective you have trained it for, especially with like the like with generative models on the horizon now. And I just want to ask if anyone at the moment has had the problem of having to like explain to people that this model is. Is learning what I intended to learn. So like there's like an ethical system for like a formal system for that, for like checking if models are have learned what you intended them to learn, like models that people are going to use. Okay. Um, I said that my question is if anyone has had to deal with the machine learning alignment problem does when you build the machine learning system how do you et like tell people that the model are the intentions of the model aligned with you with like for example with like language models a language model is just trying to predict the next word right? and with that you can like build summarization systems and all that so like if you are building a model that like let's say that is going to work on else data or something like ethically fragile has anyone worked on like any system that can like prove that a machine learning model is is also aligned with the goal we're trying to like solve? Like, in so if I get your question very well, like machine learning uh, models are not meant to align with your bias. You know, if they are, if you have something in mind, right, and then this is what you are required output, right? Uh, and then you are trying to get your model that way. It's going to lead to bias. I don't know. Maybe if I get your question correctly. I think he's trying to talk about the explainability problem, right? How you can explain your model predictions and if they are the business challenge. I think you were talking about explainability the other time, yes. Okay, I think uh, one of the things we talk about at in the center is uh, if you don't need a machine learning model, if you, can, if you have rules that can solve the problem, you can go with the rules. You don't have to necessarily always build models so that if humans can interpret that problem and solve it, you don't need to build a new model. Then if you need to build models, then you can build and also integrate, integrate it with rules. Like like you mentioned, you have a um, human in loop that will just verify to ensure that you are also solving the said problem. Then we have uh, product managers that will always interact with you to see that you are um, actually solving the problem. So we always have like a back and forth with the uh, stakeholders to ensure that uh, the business goal is actually So um, in Sterling, for example, um, let me use the fraud model. So what we do when it comes to measuring if it's actually doing what it's supposed to do is that we measure 
um, the fraudulent transactions that were caught at the beginning of the tenure or something like that. And then we measure it as to, okay, before the ML model, before we deploy it, we measure what was happening in terms of fraudulent transactions. And then after deployment, after measuring and everything, we measure what is happening. I don't know if that aligns with your question. And sometimes ESCO will call you to come and explain. Tell you if it's a very big model. You have to explain to ESCO that, okay, he gave us this huge amount of money to build a system, a, an ML system. Before then, this was what was happening. This was, these were the problems we measured. But after deploying this system, we're able to maybe reduce it by 70% or 50% you get. So you still have to give your report to a senior executive when it comes to an organizational structure. All right, so I think I can relate more with the question he's trying to ask in the sense that um, um, so you are more or less like you've built an AI system let's just say for instance a language model that does uh, maybe generate something or it can speak Yoruba, it can speak Igbo or something and you want to know whether it's able to really really understand that Igbo language right? so one of the things that I do right? for instance uh, when we were solving some of our problems around sports is that we built a reinforcement learning environment to do those tests. Do you understand? When it comes to, you know, large AI systems, when it comes to language modeling, when it comes to vision and the likes, right? What we do is we try and simulate an environment that looks like the real world setting, right? in order to evaluate if the model is actually doing very well. So we throw it so many things. That's why, you know, when it comes to, you know, some of, a lot of you guys might have been seeing some robotics video of a robot trying to learn how to run, learn how to walk, all those things. It's not like they put robots inside on the road, main road or an road, and the robot was just running. It would have caused a lot of nonsense. Do you understand? So what a lot of AI companies what a lot of AI companies, that what we do in AI companies, right, we, we create reinforcement learning systems, right, that can simulate the real world system and then we feed it with those real world information. Okay, if you see an obstacle now, what are you going to do, right? Are you going to be able to, are, are you able to avoid it? I've done a project like that, right? If you see somebody staring at you, how are you going to react? If you see somebody, somebody slap you now, are you going to turn the right cheek? So you get. So we test it with a lot of those things. So basically, the best answer is, you know, building a an environment that looks like that environment, and then see how it responds. Then from there, you can now evaluate if it's doing very well, or if actually, or if it's, if it is failing. Do you understand? And that's what determines if you can actually ship it to production, right, or not. So reinforcement learning guys are, you know, they are very, very important in your business. Right. So uh, we just have time for one final question. Uh, and, uh, the good stuff about Meetup is that, the good stuff about Meetup is that, you know, it's a networking event, right? So you can always network with the speakers right after the event to ask your questions personally. And then I think there's also going to be, there's also the MLOps community. It's like, you know, you can pose your questions there as well. Uh, so it's actually tricky to pick. Uh, okay, next question. But well, let me just uh, he asked I picking for that. Okay. Um. Sorry. I have uh, my questions for um questions. <laughs> okay. Just okay. I'll actually, just one. And I think I'll just give my question to um him because he worked around um around dynamic pricing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, I'll just join the two questions together so that it should just be one. So. You worked. You said you did mention you worked with around 100 gigabytes. So um, the first, the part A of my question would be: Was that 100 gigabytes ever enough? Did you, at a particular point, have to synthesize your data, like how to augment it to ensure that um, it was robust enough for such kind of difficult problem like dynamic pricing? And then the second, while you're productionizing your model, what metric was most important for you to monitor? to ensure that you measure things like model drift, concept drift, and data drift while you are customer facing, right? So, and then just to wrap it up, I think your question is around model explainability and model interpretability. So you should read around those two concepts. Okay, uh, so if I get your question correctly, right? Uh, 
So, um, how the first question is, just please give me the mic so I can. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so, so my okay. first question is, was it ever enough, your 100 gig? Did okay. you synthesize at any point? Okay, okay. So, right, let me pick it one by one. <laughs> so, um, as you know, right, uh, we have our own data set. Uh, and then some of those companies too that we are scraping data from, right, their inventory is also increasing. You know, it's ever increasing. And to be honest, we are very greedy. We scrape everything, you know. <laughs> so we scrape everything. As, the, as they remove it on their platform, they update it. We get everything. So, uh, I mean, I would have loved more data, to be honest, right? Uh, but then when we got to a point, uh, we scrape as much and combine it with our own internal data too, right? Because our inventory too was also increasing at a very fast rate. Uh, so, uh, data is never enough. You know, as a data scientist, you are always greedy for more data. Like, yeah, if you can get, if you can, if you can. But then, at 100 gig, I don't really need any augmentation to be honest with that problem. Uh, I use what I have, and then, uh, yeah, it works. You know. So, uh, the second question is, yeah, which metric was most important okay. for you? Yeah. So, because it's a regression problem, right? Um, uh, I mean, personally, right? Uh, I prefer RMSE, root mean square, right? Uh, for some reason, because if you are looking at loss function, right? If you are looking at loss function, now the loss, uh, if if you are looking at it, right? The difference between your predicted value and your uh, actual value, right? And then what you are looking at is a metric that is actually going to help you understand uh, how close, how uh, like how how far are, are they and how close they are. Well, then if you if you get the calculation of uh, uh, if you the root music actually gives you a more, a much more, um, a better uh, view of what is happening, how far your predictor is actually from your, uh, from your, um, from your predicted and actual value. Right? You can try it. Now, when you get right, if you get prediction right, check your if you had work on the regression problem, find difference between your predicted and actual value, right, and then I'll square it, and then I'll find the mean of it. Right, and then now find the square root of it. Now, when you find the square root of it, now now look at the difference between you, the mean square, the mean square error, and then the root mean square error. Now you see that uh, the root mean square actually gives you a better view of your data set. You know, so yeah, that's why personally I just instead of sometimes uh, I go deep into mathematics and just try to see how it actually affects my. Um, so that personally, you know, and about another person can also tell you that mean square error is better for them, right? But then. From my own, uh, uh, from my own look of things, I prefer that. Yeah. Um, after the session, connect to the speakers, ask your questions, join the MLOps community at you know MLOps.community. Join the Slack. We have an African channel there where you can you know also ask your questions as well, and then we can always try to get to them based on our expertise too. But otherwise, uh, thank you so much for the panel. Please give them a round of applause, please. So there was like LinkedIn name, Twitter's name, and yeah. Before, like after that, we'll be calling on to, to come talk about the MLOps community again. And like I said, I'm the moderator of this MLOps community, Lagos. And uh, finally, we'll be having a game basically to test your MLOps knowledge. Uh, it's a game by 3TVI. Yeah, so there's a price tag for it. Uh, the first is 75,000 chi money, uh, 50,000 chi money, and 25,000 chi money. So you can browse about what, is what, what, what that is about. It's like different MLOps community in the world, except like at the moment we are trying to currently build the MLOps community in Africa. So, yeah, so if you are moving to SA soon, Cape Town, you start saying like MLOps community, which will be the next one, obviously, like holding by, I think, a friend. We'll be handling that. And also in Hakra, we'll be coming soon for MLOps community. Hakra. Yeah, so for this session, we have the iterative game. And I'll just call the the link to the game since, yeah. So the link will be, um, since we don't have a group right yet, we, let me tell that you I'm very close to, and they need my personal recommendation. The role is data management head with no of data science and data 
governance. So in case you have some background in data science, it's good. And maybe some don't have to be an expert or certified in data management and governance. But if you have some idea about drafting policies to improve data quality, you know, reference a master data management or even master data management like MDM, any knowledge of data management and governance, it's a senior role. And if you're interested, please, I'll be, at, I'll be at the back there. Just let me know. I can get your CV. Resumption is almost immediate, so it's something that, and the pay actually is encouraging. So with a lot of perks. Uh, all right. So please, if either you are interested or you know someone that is, that role has knowledge and opportunity to work and do your ML stuffs. In case you are interested in ML ops, because um, I function at that role at some capacity before. It has that leveraging on Azure cloud technology. So all the essence of um, model building, analytics, workloads, and everything is right there in the cloud. It has the opportunity. And make sure Paul view as well for data governance, they use that as well. So uh, please, if you're interested or you know someone that sort of fit this role, I will appreciate your recommendation as well. I'll be at the back there. Thank you. Uh, I'm a Microsoft partner, and we help like organizations like build um, data and AI systems. So um, we're looking for um, DevOps engineer, just like Gift said. We're also looking for um, machine learning engineers. Um, we're looking for senior software engineers as well. I mean, just in case you know anyone, and also data engineers as as well. So um, I could give out my email, or maybe I'll just stay at the back just in case anyone is interested, and we can just um, get that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay part is just we are almost through that's like eight minutes more yeah so we are fine we are following the nigeria like like nigerian time we are not following nigerian time this time so we want to close soon i would like us to like maybe after this we collect each other's twitter and do linkedin and it's very important why so when cases like when you want to hire a data scientist a machine learning engineer in nigeria when you like that post so in your timeline can also see that and like maybe apply and get the job so we are just trying to build like a web a connection and a network so just try and collect your linkedin name like your twitter name is very important please please like we are trying to build the ml it's in nigeria to be active yeah so if you can uh, you are looking for a community to join sorry there's also data fest africa it has a discord community where you can talk about ml in africa at the moment and if, if you are looking to learn like ml at the moment uh data first because data camp uh, the, we got partnership with data camp like that was yesterday and there's opportunities for learning like free courses and all yeah so that's just it for for this moment thank you yeah and we'll be snapping like pictures this period is just for like conversation yourself snapping of pictures probably interactions with the speaker Thank you. And you can check uh, the MLOps community online. Just try and.